what, what a fantastic. Um, thank you to Bernie, Andrea, Natalie for the creative spirit that you brought to this project. Just amazing. Um, we are very fortunate because we're going to have a chat um, with some of the people you saw on the screen and some other friends of Anne, and then we're going to hear from Ron Chernow. Uh, and we'll, after the end of this, we should have some time for Q&A. So I'm going to ask the panel to kind of come up and join me as I introduce them, and then we'll have a panel discussion, and then we'll, we'll kind of get to the rest of the program. So uh, as they come up, um, first I'd like to introduce Andrea Wozni. Andrea, where, there, there she is. She was, as you saw, as the post-production director and producer of the film. Uh, Andrea has been a documentary film and TV uh, a producer uh, in, in the business for, for 20 years. Her work has appeared on PBS, CNN, BBC, National Geographic. She's done work with the United Nations. Uh, her films have shown at festivals around the world. She was recently honored by the Heckscher Museum in, of Art in New York uh, for her creative spirit. Welcome, Andrea. Thank you. <laughs> Susan Granger. Well known to this community. Um, of course, a, a prominent national commentator and entertainment critic. Um, uh, her articles appear, have appeared worldwide on the, time, the New York Times, Cosmopolitan, Red Book, Ladies Home Journal, so many more. Susan's a member of multiple critics associations. And if you read her bio, you'll find out that she was a child actress um, and worked with Abbott and Costello, Lucille Ball, and Lassie. <laughs> Um, I learned a lot by doing this. Um, uh, uh, Maya Dillon, uh, who of course is a prominent actor over many years. Uh, Maya has worked on Broadway, many award-winning roles, including Equus, Crimes of the Heart. I, I could go into Maya and Kier's, you know, filmography and stageography, but that would, we'd be here for a long time. Um, uh, Ma Maya has most recently appeared, some of you may uh, recognize her from the film, Are You There, God? It's Me, Margaret, um, uh, recently there, so, and Maya, of course, uh, and Kier and Susan, of course, are great friends of our family. Uh, so welcome, Maya. <laughs> and Kier DeLay. Of course, Kier is, is best known for the iconic role of Dave in 2001, A Space Odyssey. Um, Career has had a great, Kier has had a great career in stage and screen for decades. Um, uh, on Broadway, including Butterflies Are Free. On TV, he's gone from Bonanza to Law and Order, so watch out. Um, uh, and uh, interestingly, I learned this from your, um, from your uh, you, you did a video game recently? Is that what I understand? Yeah, a video game called um, Starfield. Um, so if you're a video, if you're gamers, go out and look for Starfield and you find that. He's won numerous arts uh, uh, honors and awards. And Kier has been, since they were teenagers, uh, the best friend of Martin West. And so he's a great friend of our family. So Kier, welcome. Um, two of these people are married. You have to figure out which two. <laughs> uh, okay, have a seat. We on? Good. Um, so let's just start. Um, how did you first come into contact with Anne's art? Just a sort of a general question. And why don't we start here, uh, down with you? Um, well, Anne and I met, I think, uh, we were introduced, I think, uh, approximately in 1980, which is when I had first moved to this area, to Westport. And, um, but I didn't really get to know Anne very well until she partnered with Martin West, who was my brother. Uh, when I say he was my brother, I was an only child. I had no siblings. Until I reached the age of 18, and I met this extraordinary man who became my brother and remained my brother. That was Martin West. But I, I, his name was, his, originally, his name was Wechselbaum, Martin Wechselbaum, that's how I knew him. He was a beautiful man, an extraordinary talent, and I find it difficult to, um, to, uh, I don't find it difficult, I find it very easy to miss him extraordinarily. But anyway, does that answer you? Yep, good, Maya? Uh, well, I married Keir. 
<laughs> That's the answer, by the way. So I guess I, I probably met Anne maybe at our wedding, um, but Anne has become a very, very close friend, and we treasure our time together. As, as all of you out there who know Anne, you treasure that time with Anne. It's true. I met Anne many, many years ago, I guess, when I first moved to Westport, uh, because we had so much in common. We loved the movies with a wild and pa a passion. And that's what we would talk about for hours on end. And I will tell you, Anne gave me the most intimidating assignment I've ever had in my life, and I've been a writer all my life, uh, when she called me one day and asked me to write the introduction to her film noir collection. And I'm not a fine artist. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm a movie critic. I love movies, but I, I, I had to go back to the books and study a lot. And I had a great time writing with Anne because writers may think they write deathless prose. Journalists know they need editors. So um, Anne and I worked together on it, and it was just a great joy. Andrew. I just met Anne today, <laughs> which was very exciting. But, but through creating this film, um, through the wonderful footage that Bernie handed to us, um, I feel like I got to know Anne and her extraordinary work um, pretty quickly. So. so Andrea, let's stay with you. And of course, your phenomenal arch archivist and editor, uh, Natalie Wolford, who's here in the audience as well, deserves a, a recognition. <laughs> you know, uh, all of. All of that fantastic imagery of the film scene uh, fading into the, into the image. Um, and thank you, Natalie. Uh, so, Andrea, your, your film really captures the connection between the original noir cinematography and the art that Anne produces exceptionally well. What, what sort of led you to develop that approach, that, that blending approach, the visual connection uh, as you worked with Natalie? Um, well, we, we got phenomenal footage from Bernie and then uh, we had to deal with the question of how do we turn this into a film. So I knew we would have, um, hopefully, we would have uh, the images um, of her, of Anne's work with the photographs. Um, I'm always fascinated by what artists are inspired by and you know how they came to um, creating their work. So here I thought, well, we're making a movie. She was inspired by the movies. Let's, let's see if we can um, get some footage from the films. And um, to, to my luck and everyone's luck, Natalie just happened to be a film noir expert and literally like off the top of her head, as soon as we got into a flow, she was like, well, wait, that, I know this scene from this movie. And, and she just went to town with it. So um, we had, sh she did an incredible job um, with all the archival footage. Um, and then it, it was really fun kind of placing it all together and um, along with Anne's images. Um, so yeah, that, and, and, and the, the, the spirit of it was I really wanted people to feel like in their own homes they were having an opportunity to kind of have a museum experience of, of Anne's work. So like as if you were walking through a museum, but then you had, you know, all this great insight of, uh, you know, her own words describing everything and um, being able to actually see the inspiration um, right, right there in front of you. Thank you. Fantastic. Uh, Kieran Maya, uh, as actors, you, you both understand the connection between visual imagery and, and audience impact. And what similarities uh, do you see that, 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 that translate from the medium of film to the medium of art? Sort of the connection between film and art is captured by Anne. And, and also, if, a follow-up, as friends of Anne's for many years, do you have any favorite anecdotes uh, about how her personal creativity is reflected in her art? Well, certainly the, the connection between art and, and film um, is you're trying to make somebody feel something. Even the abstract expressionists want to make you feel something or think something, hopefully both. So I think that's what Anne accomplishes, uh, you know, she, uh, the feelings that are in all of her um, her drawings and paintings. And I just want to thank Bernie because, you know, when, when we sat on Anne's couch and we did this filming, I, 
I hadn't, I, I mean, I, apparently, um, her, Melissa, I don't know if Melissa's here, but Melissa said her, um, one of her granddaughters found an incredible trove of Anne Chernow's works in the cellar. So um, she doesn't have the painting in the attic. She's got, she's got um, t all of these prints and fabulous things, and you unearthed all these things that I'd never seen. So thank you, Bernie, because her, her work is extraordinary. In fact, there's one painting that haunts me that I didn't buy it. Um, it was in a gallery on Fifth Avenue, um, I don't know, in the 80s or, or Madison Avenue. I don't remember where the gallery was, but we went to the opening of this, you know, one of Anne's um, exhibits, and that I didn't have the money to buy it, and I'm still kicking myself to this day. You know, the wonderful thing about Anne's work is that it gives us a different viewpoint and a different way of experiencing those famous black and white films. And it, it kind of gives us a new insight and a way of taking the time and taking it in uh, because of her work. And her work is very special and unique. And we, by the way, we also have an Anne Chernow wall. <laughs> what did I say? Yeah. Well, Great, thank you. Yes. Yes, absolutely. Terrific. So, Susan, your critiques and writings on films have influenced readers and viewers for many years. What are some keys that you have seen for a successful adaptation of film on the screen to art on the canvas? How does the film uh, reflect this creation? And as another friend of Anne, what aspects of Anne's work in life uh, reflect the adaptation? Well, I had to do some research when you, when you gave me the question. And because a lot of my writing involves a lot of research. So artists have made excellent subjects for films. There have been many films about artists because artists are storytellers who use pictorial space without the aid of motion. Painters like Pablo Picasso and Salvador Dali have used film to further their artwork. So these two art forms have been cross-pollinating ever since the very beginning of movies. And of course, movies are only 100 years old, so uh, imagine being around when painting or sculpture just began. Women have inspired movies like The Girl with the Pearl Earring, if you remember Scarlett Johansson's interpretation of the earring wearing greet painted by Colin Firth as Johann Vermeer in Peter Weber's haunting film. In Frida, Julie Taymor directed Salma Hayek as Frida Kahlo in a biopic chronicling her Mexican folklore images. Big Eyes was a film in 2014, uh, and it, most people don't realize that it was increasing deafness that caused artist Margaret Keane to concentrate on people's eyes to better understand what they were saying. And she turned that concentration into what's known as her keen eyes portraits, which then became all of that kitschy memorabilia of the 1960s. Uh, Andy Warhol uh, did Factory Girl about a young heiress named Eddie Sedgwick. And she, she was Andy Warhol's it girl. And many people, oh, great, thank you. Oh, wow. This is you why know, you have close friends. Yeah. <laughs> you know, now, now you, you go to a concert and, and they're turning pages, tapping something on the floor. Have you seen that now? I have. They have these little electronic things. I didn't come as well scores, prepared. But you didn't have one, so it's a good thing you got friends. <laughs> well, not, surprising, um, not surprisingly, uh, men have inspired more movies than women have. We have Surviving Picasso with... Anthony Hopkins, who was incredible, embodying the prolific artist, uh, concentrating on his tremendous ego. Ed Harris was Jackson Pollock in the story about him. Uh, most people remember uh, Kirk Douglas in Lust for Life, but Willem Dafoe played Vincent van Gogh also, directed by painter Julian Schnabel. Faust, uh, it basically revolved around his relationship with an art dealer. And Basquiat. Julian Schnabel made a bio, biopic about Jean-Michel Basquiat. Uh, I do want to recommend one movie that we just saw this week that I can't wait to talk about with Anne 
because it's a film noir. And it just came out this week um, on Netflix. It's called Ripley. And it's made by a, a very well-known writer who turned director named Steve Zalian. And it's, a, it's really a reinterpretation of the incredible Mr. Whit uh, the talented Mr. Ripley. And it's, it's a brilliant noir movie in black and white. And the images just stay with you the way Anne's images do. Uh, Anne is unique. I don't know of any other artist who has been so inspired by the movies. I mean, you asked me to, you know, to get together. These are all movies that were made about artists. But this is one of the best because it shows the absolute integral marriage of a, an artist's work, a person, an artist's work, and the movies. And so that's, you know, it's very inspiring. This is the first time I've seen it today, and it's just incredible. Congratulations. Well, thanks to Natalie and Bernie and, and uh, Andrea for, for that. So thanks for, for fantastic remarks. So a, a question for, for everybody before we get into sort of the next uh, part of the program. Um, in the film, uh, Anne describes her inspiration, the inspiration of the film noir specifically provides for her work. And Ron Chernow, who you heard in the film, who will speak shortly, speaks of how viewers of Anne's art might continue to appreciate that inspiration in the future. What story do you think could be told in the future about Anne for audiences, wh whether from her life, from her art, from, or from this fantastic film? I don't know if you've ever had dinner with Anne, but she's got a story about practically everything. I mean, from her life, she, I, she's, actors love acting because we get to inhabit other characters and pretend that we're living another life. But I, I'll tell you, with the number of stories that Anne has told me over the years of these incredible things that happened to her, <laughs> she's lived many lifetimes in this one lifetime. So, um, Thank you, Anne, for all the stories. And, and she's actually written some down. She's a good short story writer, too. I love the way Anne captures emotion in a second. I mean, that's what you see in her uh, etchings and her paintings. And it takes a movie a while to do that. But she captures it in one second. Here, any, any other observations? Oh, what's the question? The question is, um, <laughs> what story could be told about Anne in the future from people that see her work? Okay, I'm sorry, I'm a little hard of hearing. <laughs> so I'm, I'm... What story could be told about Anne in the future about her work? If you've seen one of these supposedly well found, if you've seen one of these supposedly well, well made films and famous films, Anne's work, I sort of said the same thing a little earlier today. This, 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 Anne's work gives you a new, brand new insight to be to appreciate it on a different level I, and, and a I, superior I, level. Yeah, I, I've never seen, is it Sunset Boulevard? That, <laughs> I've just never seen it. And seeing that, you know, Anne's work and that little still makes me want to, oh, I want to go see that movie. So mm -hmm. I think that's what's going to happen in the future. And luckily, now that they're uh, saving all of these videos and they're readily available, I mean, I, I just can't get over how Anne started painting these before you had DVDs, before you could just, you know, look on your cell phone and find a picture of a, you know, in the movie. How she, because she does have a prodigious memory, and how she remembered these films and painted them when you can't, she couldn't just go, oh yeah, I'm gonna go to the Westport Library and check out that film. You I couldn't do that back then. Um, and it's funny, because I think sometimes she captures an image and an emotion and makes it look more interesting than the actual film is. Because Kira and I have taped some of these films on TCM and watched and go, you know, I think Anne's painting was better. 
I think in the future, and Anne, you were out of the room when I talked about a movie you gotta see. I mean, this is what our conversations usually are. You gotta see this movie. But Anne, on Netflix, right now, it just started this week, is a, a, a movie called Ripley about the talented Mr. Ripley. It's a film noir in black and white by Steve Zalian. And I predict for the future, you will be doing a painting from it. <laughs> Andrea, any future film ideas? Anything along those lines? I, I think um, Anne's work is so powerful. It just captures a timeless um, spirit of these women, no matter what you know, time period they're from, no matter what situation they're in, even in kind of oppressive situations, a woman behind bars, there's just this powerful spirit that like anyone, any woman, anyone from any generation can, um, you know, feel and, uh, and feel immediately and kind of, you know, whatever situation you're in, you can, you know, have, you know that spirit translates. So I think that's why people, um, resonate so much with the work and why Natalie and I just right away we we're like wow how have we never seen these before so I think that will continue I, what I love and admire so much is that and and I hadn't realized it until I saw it in the movie but I've heard you say it in the past is how Anne was criticized in her early work because she didn't conform to what her teachers or critics or anybody else said, that she had her own path. And she took it and she stayed on it. And she has made it a unique contribution to art. Bernie, do you want to come up and speak into the mic? Speak into the mic so people can hear you. <laughs> Ten minutes later, um, <laughs> when, when this film premiered at the Long Hill Township Library, I was supposed to take questions at the end, but it became a roundtable discussion. The first ten minutes was about the courage. Board teachers threw you out because you wouldn't do what they saw as their vision through you. And all of them said, that is amazing. And I said, I would have caved ten minutes. To, you know, and I showed this film on Wednesday at Westchester Community College. And I said, what are each of you doing? What? And most of them hadn't found their direction yet. And I said, learn from what Anne did. You find your niche and don't let anybody say otherwise. Audience, no audience, this is how you want to express it. And there's a film, uh, Never Let Go, about Gerhard Richter's early days, where he's ridiculed at first. And then the students in Berlin start to respect his tenacity. Well, OK, that didn't work. And he hits photorealism. And they're like, wow. And he has a show in, you know, in a major gallery. And he just won't cave to anyone else's vision, just like you. Thank so, you, Bernie. Thank you. So just a quick uh, another acknowledgment before. We're going to do Q&A. Yes. Hold that thought. We're going to do Q&A from the microphone uh, in a few minutes. Um, before I introduce our keynote uh, final speaker, I just want to also acknowledge those you were kind to clap for several of the credits in the movie, including two and two great partners, Bert Chernow and Martin West. So thank you for that on behalf of our families. Uh, I also want to acknowledge, uh, you also uh, acknowledged, I think, Migs Burroughs, who's here, who did the terrific uh, films, uh, photo shoots of Anne's work, who, of course, writes, uh, does a column with Anne in the work. And so many stories could be said of so many of you and your work with Anne. Uh, but now I'd like to introduce uh, our final speaker, uh, a great friend, a great person, who needs no introduction, but I'll do one anyway. Um, uh, Ron Chernow, uh, of course, has written many award-winning books, including one that was made into a small musical. Uh, on Broadway. Um, he has won, he's been the president of, of the prestigious Penn organization. He's won eight, he's been awarded eight honorary doctorates. He's won a Pulitzer Prize, the National Book Award, the National Humanities Medal. Lucky for our family, uh, he is a cousin um, through marriage to Bert Chernow, who of course is a great uh, supporter of the arts in Westport. And we're just so thrilled to be able to, to know Ron and to see him on a regular basis. So Ron, please come up and join us. Thank you, Dan. You know, I feel so proud to be part of this 
event. I just want to start out by saluting uh, Bernie and Andrea as co-directors, Natalie as archivist and editor, Miggs as the photographer, Nico for video and sound. I think that each of these people added, made a very, very singular and special contribution to this, and it was just one of these lucky accidents, the way that it was all synthesized into what I think is an absolutely brilliant documentary. Now, Anne mentioned during the documentary her fascination with the bad and dangerous women. And I think that with the benefit of hindsight, we could see that it was those malls and vamps. It was the women with the knives and the guns. They seemed like the real forerunners of feminism rather than nice, polite ladies who were sitting home, you know, keeping a house. And uh, it's interesting that uh, Anne is attracted to these women who enjoyed inhabiting the dark fringes of society. Um, I've noticed, I've known Anne, what, about 35, 40 years now? I've noticed uh, an interesting evolution in her work. When I first started seeing her work, of course, set in the 1940s, women were the, the subject. But the women struck me as, and they were beautiful works, the women struck me as uh, soft and dreamy. They seemed more passive in a way. Very often they were sitting there staring into space or at the stars waiting for something to happen in their lives. But it's interesting, as you follow her work, something much wilder starts to come out in the work. The women become more sexual, they become more aggressive, they become bolder and more confident, as if Anne's id is conquering you know, her super ego. And I think if we put Anne on the analytic couch, she would be the first to admit that there's a kind of wish fulfillment quality to a lot of these uh, uh, images. Now, it's mentioned, you tell the story, uh, Anne, how um, that hostess who suggested that you leave your husband and go to New York and become uh, rich and famous, and you didn't do it. I think the fact that uh, Anne stayed in Westport has um, been a very, very important part of her career. Had Anne gone to New York, uh, I think that she would have felt the pressures of the New York marketplace, um, the pressures of the critics. I think that being in Westport has given her a healthy distance, frankly, from the New York uh, art world, has made it easier for her to be true to her own vision and march to her own drummer, at the same time that Westport has a long distinguished uh, history of um, being uh, home to uh, artists. And so Anne was distant from New York, but always surrounded by artists here at the same time. You know, have, Anne has been a, a tremendous presence in my life, and um, the movie gives you a sense of the abundance and variety of her uh, art. But I want to give you a slightly rounder portrait of her life, because, yes, she's been this amazingly prolific uh, artist. But her engagement with the world of art is actually much wider. I like to think of Anne as an evangelist for art, an ambassador for art. Anne and my cousin Bert were very instrumental in bringing art into the Westport schools, very instrumental in founding the Housatonic Museum of Art um, in uh, Bridgeport, part of a, a community college. And I think all of this for Anne was animated by a belief that art should be fully shared and enjoyed by everyone. There's a very, very democratic spirit to everything that she has done. You know, for me, her involvement with the arts has taken on a very personal uh, dimension. About 15 years ago, Anne called me up one day and said, I want to help you to create a great art collection. Uh, my wife and I had bought art, but it was really just from friends who were artists and we were buying out of their uh, studios. Anyway, I took Anne up on the offer and this became so addictive. I mean, she's my dealer, that's a good term. <laughs> became so addictive that I now have about 120 130 paintings, drawings, prints, and sculpture. And the vast majority were bought with Anne as my advisor and, yes, uh, dealer. Um, now, my first cousin, uh, Bert, who died in 1997, uh, Bert was kind of a renaissance man in the art uh, world. He was the authorized biographer of Christo and Jean-Claude. He founded um, a museum. Uh, he was a critic, he was a photographer, he was a teacher, but he was also an art dealer. And this was important because his dealing in art was a significant part 
of their income. Well, after Bird died rather suddenly in 1997, Anne thought to herself, well, I watched Bert deal art for all of those years, and I think that I can do it. And as gigantic, you know, as her creation of art has been, she's also had a gigantic career as an art dealer and advisor and appraiser. I mean, she's a real double threat, this, this lady. There's so many sides to her life. I can tell you from long experience, Anne's knowledge uh, of art is encyclopedic. She has an encyclopedic knowledge of the artists and of the art market. And there are many people who have one or the other, but not um, both. Um, she has not only helped me, but I think a number of other people in this room to create great collections. And she's done so in the most selfless and dedicated manner, charging us only a very tiny fraction of what she could have gotten uh, elsewhere. This is very time consuming work. Uh, to be good at being an art advisor and dealer, you're constantly surfing the web and going through all of these auctions and galleries. And Anne has been absolutely tireless in my behalf and others. And I must tell you, we've been through so many experiences together buying uh, different works of art. And each one for me has been a master class because of uh, art. You know, Anne for me harks back to an older spirit of connoisseurship. That is, today, when you're trying to authenticate a work of art, usually there are scientific experiments in terms of did this pigment exist at the time? You know, did they use these stretchers at the time? You know, whatever. Whereas with Anne, it's this unerring eye informed by um, deep familiarity, long devotion to many uh, artists. And her instincts are absolutely uncanny. I'm going to give you a couple of anecdotes that I think will make the point. I'd long wanted to have a beautiful drawing by uh, Gustav uh, Klimt, and we looked for uh, many years, and finally I called up Anne one day and I said, I think I found one at Bonham's. It was a study, it was large, vertical, it was on brown paper, it was a study for the famous woman in gold painting, the Adele Bloch Bauer. Uh, the Helen Mirren movie, if you've seen it. And I said, Anne, it's absolutely gorgeous. She looked at it, you know, online, and she said, you're, you're, you're right, it's uh, amazing. And it was signed by Klimt. Uh, she called me back a day or two later, and she said, something bothers me about the signature. You know, and it looked exactly the way that Klimt would always sign it. But it bothered her. This was like this instinctive thing. So being Anne, she contacted a woman at the Albertina Museum in Vienna who was the world's leading authority in Klimt drawings. The woman was very helpful, and she sent Anne back a photograph of that drawing in the catalog resume, and there indeed was the drawing. This was an authentic uh, drawing. But in the photograph, there was no signature. Anne knew something was wrong with the signature, but the signature was kind of a, you know, a spot-on forgery of uh, Klimt's uh, uh, signature. It was amazing. Um, the other one, which was kind of no less uncanny, Anne knows I love German Expressionist art, and I wanted to buy a, a print from the 1920s by Otto Mueller. And it was a special print because um, Mueller had, um, uh, with watercolor, had, had, had painted over the surface uh, of the, uh, the, the, the print, making it something other than ordinary print. Again, Anne called me uh, a day or two later, and uh, she said, there's something that bothers me about the hand coloring. I can't put my finger uh, on it. It was, it was beautiful. It was being offered for a fair amount of money by the Swan Auction House. Anne started to investigate, and guess what? Uh, she found out that the person uh, who was selling it, was wanted by the police in Germany <laughs> for these forgeries, and that that hand coloring uh, had been added later on by this uh, dealer. We contacted Swan. They, of course, immediately dropped it from the catalog. And so when you came to the auction, they went from lot 124 to lot 126, not ever explaining what had happened to lot 125. Uh, the, the Anne has the most marvelous sense of humor. It's made it a joy to, to deal with her. She told me very early on 
that uh, Bert used to say, uh, you never know what price something is gonna fetch at auction because you may find yourself uh, bidding against two drunken Japanese. Uh, and I have to say, very often over the years, Anne and I have been the two drunken Japanese that other people, you know, are bidding uh, against. And we have just had a ball. Very often we're sitting there, we have our bid in, we're watching the auction online. And then if our high bid, it looks like, uh, you know, we're out in front and we're screaming together at the screen, you know, <laughs> bang down the, the hammer, bang down the hammer. And I have to say, most of the time that we have gotten it. It's been one of the great, great pleasures in my life to work with Anne on this, to have Anne in my life as a relative, a friend, and an advisor. And I can't tell you how happy I am and how grateful I am to everyone involved with this documentary. I'm so grateful that we're all here to celebrate Anne and her work together. Thank you. All right, so Jennifer, uh, here at the library, hold on, Ron, let me, so we don't get feedback. Hold that. Um, Jennifer says that we do have time for a few questions, right? We, we have time for one or two questions. Okay. I will ask that anyone who has a question for someone on the stage come here. We are recording this, so we'd like to be able to hear what everybody has to say. Uh, I, I have an anecdote while we're waiting for people to line up, which is, you saw all those, um, drawings, paintings of the ladies up there with guns, right? Well, when Bert died, he had a gun, and it was about 10 seconds before uh, Anne got rid of that gun. She took it to, and she's got a great story about taking it to the dealer to, to take it back. And she put it in a shoebox and, and uh, could hardly wait to get that gun. So, so a lot of these, these are definitely imaginary. Yeah. It's a fantasy. It's a fantasy. It's a fantasy. I do remember that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much. What a tribute to Anne and to all of you involved. Ron, your comments, you know, and I think Anne has a visceral connection to these film noir ladies, or whether they're ladies or, you know. Uh, I have a picture of Anne from years ago as a sultry woman, and I just feel like she's living a life alongside her life as she lived it in, through these images. So I'd love for you to talk about that visceral connection, maybe, that she had creating these film noir ladies. Oh, I think, you know, as I was saying, I think that Anne clearly identifies with these ladies. I think that, as so often with, with art, uh, creating these images has uh, given Anne the opportunity and all of us the opportunity to kind of try on different personalities for, for, for style. Um, I think that the power of the pictures is that we can very easily project ourselves into it and identify with it. And after all, I'm, I'm a man, but it, it's... Um, the, the fact that the uh, images are all of women doesn't in any way, I think, exclude men or male appreciation of it. Because as Anne says in the documentary, uh, I think that her works are powerful because they're very um, uh, universal. And I thought, Susan, you made an excellent point. There's something that, in terms of the emotional charge of each picture, you immediately get it, which is something very, very hard, which I think film does. Uh, brilliantly, uh, but I think sometimes, you know, maybe is more difficult even for an artist to do. If you have a question, I will ask that you come to the microphone. It's not a question, but the appreciation when Anne taught a class at Norwalk Community College and her inspiration was so important to the students there. It was wonderful, and we all thanked her for that. OK. There are no other questions. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Bernie, if you want to come back up on, on stage, and then my brother Dave, who, if you want to come back up uh, and um, close us out. Bernie, just come on up. Just. Just come on up. <laughs> <laughs> this is so great. I didn't have to do anything. <laughs> um, you know, uh, the folks who were involved in uh, the film, 
uh, have been thanked multiple times uh, today, which, and it's just a, a, a work of love to my mom. Um, but the other person we wouldn't be here today without is my brother, who put all this uh, together uh, with, with help. Um, uh, we're, we're graced to have mom here today. Will you give everybody a little wave, mom? Thank you all for coming. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Thanks to the panel. Uh, there's still food and drink over there. Uh, everybody enjoy. Uh, have a good rest of your day. Take care.